we're live. Hi, and welcome to the future of games animation. I'm here by intimidated by, so please don't mind if I do this a lot. Uh, hopefully, they will help us figure out how this stops happening in the game, but not yet. First, we're going to do some introductions. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Dan Lowe. I'm a senior technical animator at uh, Motive Studios, which is an EA studio in Montreal. Hi, uh, I'm Rina Harper. I'm from Epic Games, animation senior, animation engineer. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Holden. So I work at Ubisoft Montreal at the research lab there called Laforge, and I do uh, research into machine learning for character animation. Awesome. Now, I'm going to play this video here that one of our esteemed colleagues, Christian the Stack Jean Juke, uh, played at a GDC a couple of years ago. And a couple of years ago, this was the future. How many games have you guys seen with this future in it come out? One ish, one ish, right? It's like, it's like four or five. Yeah, four or five. <laughs> what? Oh, well, Dan, you were supposed to tell me that before I made that joke. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is that the future of game animation, there's always a future of game animation. And uh, 20 years ago, it was motion capture, and it was going to put us all out of jobs. Uh, 10 years ago, it was probably blend trees and state machines were going to make it so that we never had to worry about you know, tossing the stuff over the fence anymore. And uh, it was all going to be easy and everything would work and we wouldn't need programmers to get our stuff in the game. And a couple of years ago, it was motion matching. So I think now, in order to give everybody a primer as to what exactly it is that we're going to be talking about, we should kind of go over what is the overview of the current animation tech in the industry right now that people are actually using uh, to kind of give a, a groundwork for where we want to go and where you guys think we are going to go. Who wants to go first? I'll talk about that. Um, so we're kind of going through sort of a renaissance, really, at the moment in terms of uh, animation tech, at least with runtime uh, animation tech in, uh, in games, uh, with all of these things like motion matching and with neural network stuff. Um, but sort of traditionally, the way that, um, that it's worked for the last kind of I don't know, decades, really, has been um, with state machines, which is really any animation system is really trying to do one thing. It's saying, like, I have a character, and I want to know what the next pose is on that character. I want to know what the next piece of motion is that I have to play on that. And so for the longest time, the way that we decide to do that is that um, we have logic systems, which is really, a state machine is really just kind of like a big flow chart. So if you've ever done sort of one of those questionnaires where it's like, you know, what would be my ideal job? Or, which Harry Potter house should I be in, <laughs> or whatever else it is. And you're answering these questions where it's kind of like, uh, you know, do, do you like talking on the telephone? Do you like working with computers? Well, then do this. Like, uh, you know, and it goes through this flow chart until you get to, to an answer. We're sort of do, doing the same sort of thing with animation systems uh, in that we're asking questions like, how fast am I going? And what weapon am I holding? What gender am I? You know, it's all of those kind of things. Um, and that ultimately filters down to a single piece of animation that should be playing next. And this is all driven by what the controls, uh, you know, the, the player's inputs, the situation that surround, uh, surrounds that player uh, in the game. And, uh, but the, the kind of situation that we're at at the moment with, uh, with state machines is that um, to, to get better quality, you have to make them more and more complex. Uh, because uh, say that I'm doing a run cycle and I have to, like, stop halfway through that. Uh, I have a choice of just you know, jumping immediately to a stop animation, or I can play a left foot or right foot version, or I could play a left foot on contact and, or a left foot on passing. And the more and more permutations of these that you have to do, the more complex that these graphs get to the point that it looks like this big spaghetti mess. Right. And so going forward, it's kind of like we, that's, that's untenable going forward. We have to come up with some alternative solutions to deal with some of that complexity. And this is where something like motion matching uh, comes in. OK. Um, so uh, going off of that, now, Lena, you work at Epic, and you work on uh, the Unreal Engine a lot, obviously. Yes. Um, and so how, has, how have, with the current technology, you've been working with teams who are finding themselves in these really complex state machines and, and blend systems and whatnot? Like what, right now, how are you handling supporting that? And where do you think the, 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 the wins of those systems are and the shortcomings are in general? Um, yeah, OK. So um, I 
There's so many studios, we work with a lot of licensee and a lot of people ask how to work um, on the state system with multiple people because it's one big state system and that's very hard to maintain uh, with a very complicated stage. And I've seen many nightmare of this state motion that you cannot even figure out. Like you have to zoom out so far out to be able to see everything. Um, yeah, it has a limitation to a certain point. Uh, the goal is you could provide some kind of tool to work uh, together and compose or like uh, um, like uh, compact making more like one node so you can just uh, zoom in to it or like there is a um, suggestion for a different kind of view instead of like doing state system where uh, you can look like more like a stack system where you can see like uh, you can see different kind of view so, so providing different view visualization can help the problem but um, there's just some limitation to, because it's not just the tool to that point, it's like a human error. Like you, it's too complicated, you cannot really understand what's going on, so you make a mistake. So that, be, that be, can be some problem. So, so what I'm hearing from you is that humans are the ones who are screwing this all up, and we clearly need machines to help. Um, yeah, the beauty of motion matching and machine learning, all these uh, um, awesome systems are, it can um, consume all this data inside, and then it can provide the output. So you have so many data, so it, your uh, output motion looks also natural and has many variation of information. So it, it's uh, awesome in some... Yeah. yeah, I think as well it's, um, it's hard to underestimate the kind of size of these things. So I asked some of the guys at Ubisoft to get me some rough stats on the state machine in the latest Assassin's Creed, and they were saying that it's got roughly uh, like 15,000 animations and 5,000 states, and it's like it got a depth of kind of 10 or 11. So like, it's really, you can't kind of comprehend how big these systems are. And uh, like Lina was saying, it's really a tooling thing there. Like, uh, there's big tools, big, really powerful tools. And that's the only way right now where you can build the size of state machines and manage this sorts of complexity. And I imagine that QAing those is a giant pain. The yeah. bigger, obviously, the bigger they get. We've all worked with in them, but the, something that size, I can imagine, you know, it, it, you start to understand why, uh, as those games and their sequels come out, that there are bugs that are that might have been are there that might have not been there before because they're building on top of that so much. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, that does happen. Um, one thing I usually say to people is. Like because a human way of thinking sometimes can be create very complicated graph. If you think of some different directions, sometimes it can help to simplify problems, but yep. that's side of comment. <laughs> all right. Okay, so uh, does anybody else want to talk a little bit more or at all about what we're, where we are now, or should we kind of start jumping into what like the near term, the new things that are coming that are, are a little bit more feasible in the next few years to be used by uh, content creation teams, engineering teams, just games sure. in general. You want to do it, Dan? Oh, You're looking right at oh. me, or am I looking <laughs> at you? Um, so I guess in the immediate future, the, like motion matching is really the the next sort of step, and a lot of studios are already doing this. There's a couple of games that have been uh, released uh, that have motion matching uh, in it already. Uh, I think For Honor was the first uh, the first one to do it, but I know that lots of uh, EA sports games and um, and I know that there was some stuff in Mass Effect and a few different things uh, they that they use motion matching, and um, so motion matching was really kind of like the hot button thing uh, from GDC 2016. There was a couple of presentations that came out, and I think a lot of studios now are jumping on that, but it's kind of still in, um, in development in a lot of places. And really what it's doing is, uh, the, the dream for it at least, is you just take all of your animations that you've made and you drop it into one big database, and instead of building out all of these questions that you have to, um, that you have to ask about the situation that the character is in, um, it, the system itself is automatically figuring some of that stuff out. Um, I think at first it's terrified like a lot of animators because they felt like this was going to take over their jobs. Uh, and it's sort of very similar to the way that uh, motion capture right. um, did. But really, you still have to curate the data. You still have to clean up the motion. Um, it's, you know good for game systems, but it's not necessarily good, going to be good for acting pieces and things right. like that. Yeah, I mean, you still um, have to make it look 
like this yeah. run is going to look like this run because you made sure it, you creatively cr made it that way, either through direction and motion capture or pumping through a lot of hand key animation. Right. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. I think the the thing about motion matching was uh, it became clear that it would be possible to use a lot more data than you could before because it didn't have to be hand curated in the same way with the state machine. So in that sense, uh, maybe you can use more motion capture data which hasn't been touched by animators or has been touched briefly by animators to uh, like make it look better and make it look more heroic and these sorts of things. But maybe it, you can see it as opening up to a bigger scale of data and more data and maybe more data than could be handled by animators. Yeah, and I think um, Simon Clavet, who's kind of like the one of the fathers of this, at least uh, for, for practically using it in games, uh, he was the For Honor kind of uh, expert and did their system for this. His original kind of idea uh, was like, I'm just going to get two mocap actors, I'm going to drop them in a mocap stage, and they're going to fight for five minutes, and then I'm just going to let the system figure it all out. And it <laughs> turned out, once we actually started looking at it, that it's it's doesn't really work like that. It sometimes picks things that you don't want it to pick. And so it was really then a case of trying to figure out how to kind of uh, make it so that the data works with what the system wants. And so it's, a, it's taking some time, I think, for animators to get used to how to work with this. But I, I think um, it's going to eventually it's going to be a useful tool in the toolbox. And I think people should see it like that, that it's a useful yeah. tool in the toolbox and not a replacement yeah. for... It's, it's, it's a lot like motion capture, right? It's a productivity tool. And it's just right now, it's when motion capture came out, as long ago as it did, uh, it wasn't as much of a productivity boost as it is now in the right situations. And I think that if people look at you know motion matching and future tech in that way, it becomes less scary. But it also, I mean... It's really exciting to see that, like, what could happen, and like, what, like, the things that will come up with next. That is the next productivity tool. Like, if, if motion matching becomes like the next motion capture in that way, then what's the what's the thing that makes everybody say, like, oh, it's just motion matching?" Um, but speaking of productivity tools, I know that Lena has some stuff she'd like to talk about on the work that she's doing, and so I'm going to just hit F5 on this thing. Maybe, yeah. There we go, and here you go. Awesome. Um, so I wanted to show some of the tool we are working on, and it's called Control Week. And um, so um, we demoed this last year at GDC, um, showing animating character in sequencer. And this was um, so to be clear, Control Rig is not animation tool, but it is a rigging tool. We are working on rigging tool to uh, rig an engine. So uh, the reason of this prototype was to uh, figuring out how to make the tool and what's our goal to get to this tool. So uh, what is Control Rig now? So the Control Rig is scriptable rigging system in Unreal Engine. It's a blueprint framework, but it's using native execution system, so it's extremely fast. Because the goal of us is always performance, we have to make it fast, we cannot be slow. But it's a um, node graph you can um, use to uh, script, and it, like, each node is a weak core, weak unit, and those are like include constraint, aim constraint, or um, apply FK or IK FK switcher. So we create this unit to so that you can do this in engine. Um, you take like uh, input as a hierarchy. You can like multi hierarchy. The goal is uh, later on we want also want to support like a modular modular rigging rigging system. So you can actually do like ARM, and you can reuse the same ARM for like four ARM characters. So why control rig? Uh, why do we want this for engine? One thing we know about our um, from Unreal Engine is that we know that once you have a powerful tool, it can be very um, extensible and flexible, and user can create all the tool for us. <laughs> so the goal was because we we could have made just bipedal humanoid, but we know so many characters in game that. Um, we wanted to like give you guys to create every characters. 
So basically what you're saying is it, this is a control rig that is in-game and can drive like a, a skeleton that you can change in Maya and not worry about like the, the animation being too affected by it. Yes, um, so it's not really animating tool, but it can be used as animating tool. It's the, um, you can create the hierarchy in engine. You can like, uh, um, create your reports and yeah, you can do all that in, in engine. So the first application, sorry, my notes got messed up, so I had to fix them, <laughs> sorry. So uh, first application for this tool is uh, obviously animating an engine. So uh, what, I don't know if I, like, it helps uh, improve workflow pipeline. Um, you can prototype animation quickly. Um, if you don't know how to use Maya or Blender, you can animate quickly in engine. Wait, does this mean that designers and programmers are going to start animating? They can if they want All right, to. No, wait, no, no. We have Maybe to stop. not well. We have to stop. I don't know about that. Well, many people have like, a, I want to create this swing thing, and then they have to wait for somebody to make it. It takes very long time. So if you just do this, it might help. But it won't be. <laughs> I know, but that, that's what I said, prototype. Did you hear prototype? Okay, so pro okay prototyping. All right, that's fair. So this is something that's going to help speed up prototyping gameplay features yes. and remove bottlenecks. Yes. And in turn, uh, presumably make the game better and help animators actually have more time to do polished work. Yeah, better work because you don't have to create all this prototype animation for everybody. You can just do... Designer can de like create sample animation and it doesn't work, try something else. And when it works, they're like, I need animation for this guy. Nice. <laughs> right? All right. Um, the, uh, the other application, like a cinematic tweaks, because the cinematics are based on shot bases. So you usually, like, you kind of animate, bring in, and you're like, I don't like this pose. I have to move ahead a little bit. And that's when it's useful. Um, Dan, I think you wanted to... I was just going to say, this kind of thing is potentially really powerful because like, we spent, as technical animators, we spent so much time trying to uh, give good feedback to our animators about what it's actually going to look like once it gets into the engine. Because the way that constraints might solve in um, Maya or the way that cloth might work in Maya or something like that is not going to be the same as it works in, in the engine. And so if you can just be animating directly in the engine and just see exactly what it is that you're going to get, it's going to make a huge difference to the turnaround time uh, for that stuff. And then potentially the, the idea of just playing the game and then pausing and then I'm going to move this bit here like is a... Uh, is, I mean, maybe that's a bit further into the future. I don't know, but yeah. it's, uh, that's, I mean, that's really... There are already tools like in VR, like animating characters. Yeah, 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 yeah. there's already things like that. So it would be cool because you can do VR and then just animate and capture all thing and change it, right? Tweak it. So, um, so the the other um, options is like we have like a request from marketing team. They want to animate face, and to do that, it's a lot more work. So this kind of helps. Um, so next application is uh, in game rigging. So it's more like a procedural rigging where like uh, um, pistons or like twist joint, you don't have to import them. You can just do everything just do in engine. Um, it's less joint to animate or import. So save the memory and uh, less time to decompress animation. <laughs> and you can also go to the runtime rigging with it this way because you can just animate the aim target point and then you can use that to um, uh, in game. So that's good application. And the third one I have with this one is uh, this was an example from Ubisoft IK system. It was really cool. Um, I hope I get his name right. Alexander Berenciak. Berenciak. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. In his uh, uh, presentation, it's really cool because you can just use rig to retarget all the um, animation. And uh, because we have some very um, primitive retargeting system, but it's only using um, FK and but using rig data to retarget is gonna really help um, to retarget better. And you can see your animation that way. So okay. So I want to show you the video of what's current status of what's happening. So this is current progress. So we, it's like a blueprint, and you can like um, have a preview mesh. 
this is each node here is something we I said like a weak unit, and that's like a, I can get this joint transform, and I can like apply FK to this guy, or I can do tube on IK, and some of those units are we we call control units, and those are something you can manipulate in engine, and they can be animated. So it's the property that can be animated, and you can just do, uh, move them. And this is the example of IK and aim constraint. So once you do that, you can animate in sequencer because those are properties. You can just do um, those control units I had. Those are something you can animate in the sequencer. So this was an example um, the created. Um, it's just do, um, it's simple, but it shows you what you can do with it. And I'm terrible animator, so you can tell. <laughs> So we're, we're all safe, guys. Don't worry. They're not, they're not going to take us over yet. We, we still have time to learn how to program. So this is a third example um, of a procedural rigging. So this is a claw, it's a groundlet that we have in Fortnite. Um, and I didn't want to animate. So how do I not animate but use a finger motion to animate the claw? So this was an example of like using this in game. So in the um, anim blueprint, you can add, add this node control uh, node, and then you can just uh, hook it up, and you can see the um, like a body motion, like finger motion is gonna now drive all the claw. So in here, you I don't know if you can tell, but uh, she's like pointing, and it's following index finger. So you can see the claw is now following. There's no animation, but anything you can do quickly is something you can just um, use control rig to do in. Engine rigging, yeah. Nice, awesome. Yeah, so that's basically um, example of um, the how this system works. It's not out yet. Um, it's going to be probably experimental feature for 4.20, but um, then you can check out how that is. Yeah. Awesome. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> nice. All right, so we looked at stuff that you know is coming down the pipe in an existing pipeline, is the existing engine and everything, things that we can just go download as soon as it's available. That's awesome. Uh, but now, you know, this is the future of games animation, and so this is near future. Uh, Daniel, I know that you've done a lot of stuff that is both near and far and really, really, really far. Uh, so, and we have some videos, yeah. apparently, to look at. Uh, Dan, you have to tell me which ones are on. This one? Uh, is it that one? Is it that one? Okay. So I'll, so this is a, a video of some research I did uh, just before joining Ubisoft. So I'll try and uh, explain kind of roughly what you're seeing here. All right. <laughs> so the basic idea is that uh, in a kind of similar setup to motion matching, we want to give some high level goal like uh, a path on the ground to follow. And as output, we want to produce the next pose of the character. Um, and in motion matching, this is done by basically like searching through all the animation data in the database and picking the clip which best fits what you want to happen next. So where you want to go and what speed you want to be going at. And what we did in this research was we kind of replaced that with a neural network which generates the next pose directly. So you give us input. Uh, the goal for what you want the character to do. So in this case, it's like the trajectory along the ground and the direction you want the character to be facing. And it directly produces as output the pose of the character. So it's not like searching through a database or anything like that. It's really generating each pose on the fly. And we do train this with data. So what we do is we give many, many examples of uh, trajectories along the ground and corresponding motions of the character moving along that trajectory. So here's some examples of the data we used. And because we wanted to show how powerful this idea was, we also captured lots of data of the character walking over different rough terrain. So we want to show that it can really adapt to many, many, many different kinds of situations. So now this is something where you fed the data in and it, I'm going to pause this so we don't get too far ahead, and it learned how this character should move Yeah. So right, to figure out how to solve climbing up those little the ledges. And exactly. Everything. So it really learns like a, a mathematical function, 
which takes as input the trajectory along the ground, which the user wants, and produces as output the pose of the character which matches that. So uh, that's what it uses the data for, is to try and learn this function. Okay. And, and uh, stop me if I'm getting too far ahead, but uh, if now, you know, it's, it's learning based on the, the data that was input. So if we had somebody uh, who was moving a little bit more exaggerated, a little bit more goofy and everything, would it learn that, that that's what that character's physics are and that's how it would try to move? Yeah, exactly. So since I did this at the university, this is actually data of me walking around. So you can see I run funny, but yeah. And, but if you put a real actor in a real suit and did some stylized motion and fed it in, then that's what it would learn. And similarly, if you edited the data as an animator, then it would learn those edits too. The problem is that we captured kind of uh, two gigabytes of motion capture data. So that was kind of like, uh, I think it was about four hours or something like this. So oh, we can do that. That's, <laughs> we, just, we do it like in a day. I don't know. I think Shum said it took him like 10 minutes once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the power here is that we could capture so many different varieties of going over different terrains in different combinations, different speeds, and different, uh, yeah, so, and then we could just kind of throw it all into this neural network and we get something out. So you have to design the neural network with some sense. It's not quite as magic as it seems. And it takes a bit of skill to do this well. But the idea kind of remains the same. And one of the really interesting things about this approach, which separates it from motion matching, is that in motion matching, the performance and the memory usage kind of scales uh, with how much data you try and use with it. So if you use a gigabyte of data with motion matching, that's how much memory it's going to take, and it's going to take a long time to evaluate each frame. Whereas the neural network approach, uh, it doesn't matter how much data you feed it, the runtime cost and the memory usage remains constant. So in theory, at least, you can feed it data on so many different vast varieties of situations and produce nice corresponding motion as output without kind of paying any additional costs. So that's the kind of exciting reason to use neural networks for me is that they have this like incredible scalability when it comes to data. Uh, but I see why that's also kind of a scare, scary yeah. thing as well. No, yeah. no, and I mean, that's why I, you know, I asked, you know, can we, as animators, you know, we, we would we like to direct the motion capture as much as we can when we do do that. Uh, so we would still have some sort of like there is still a creative control over this process because it is basing its its like output on the data that was input prior. Yeah, exactly. So you can still edit the data and control which data you give it, and that will control what results you get to some degree. But it's really not it's because it's not just playing back data which you fed it, it's actually generating it on the fly. You don't have the same kind of guarantees about what it's gonna do. Um, and so that's kind of a bit scary as well in that you can train it on a particular data, but you can't guarantee that's exactly how it's gonna look once you've trained it and once you run it. Okay. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Dan. I was gonna say, where this is kind of relevant for animators is that uh, it's, the amount of data that you need in order to train the system, because it's, you know, we talk about four hours worth of data to do like a locomotion set. If you think about how many frames you clean up in a in a day worth of mocap, it's it's going to take a single animator like four years or something to uh, to clean up a single loco set for that. So um, instead, I would kind of expect that a lot of uh, the way of working with this kind of stuff is going to have to be automated ways of of processing that data or coming up with better capture methods in order to capture things like fingers and uh, capture you know, surface details and all of the other things that you, know, you might um, put into that data, which might end up shifting animators over to things that neural networks are not necessarily good at, like performance thing, pieces or uh, things that we can't mocap. Like, right. you can't mock up a dragon, like yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. so, not yet. No. It's funny, yeah, you, you, like uh, for example, if I, when I showed this research to some people in film studios and I say it needs uh, three hours of animation data, 
Well, if you have three hours of animation data, you've already made your film, so <laughs> you don't <laughs> yeah. need it anymore if that's the case. Right. Yeah, you're better off just getting that whatever you need for the movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so, I, uh, I think what Dan says is exactly right, that like maybe there are some areas where it's actually okay to have a lot of data which you can maybe even pre-process with some rough heuristics if you want to stylize it in a particular way. And that's actually something which the, the control rig stuff is super good for, is that you can really easily make little procedural tweaks to animation to stylize it in the way you want. Um, and then, yeah, maybe after that, the kind of more handcrafted stuff is going to be more where it's important, which is like kind of cutscenes and cinematics and all these really uh, key elements of the game. Okay. So I'm, a, I'm an animator, and I've seen this, and I love it, and I want to show my boss. I want to, I want to like get some of this. How, how am I going to do that? How am I going to present this to my team and say, look, there's this new tech, I think it's going to do really well, and uh, I, need some, I need a bunch of tools in order for me to work on that data, like you said, Dan. Uh, I need a control rig in-game you know, in so that I can modify it, and then I need the actual system itself. What, what does it take? What will it take for that to become a thing that is, I, when I go to Studio uh, A or B, I know that they're going to use it because it's, it's commonplace now? I think uh, it's really early right now and it's really not mature technology and there are lots and lots of questions that need to be answered and problems that need to be solved and so yeah there's 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 just so many things that need to be done so one is just like uh, basic ways to edit and control what you're going to get in some reasonable fashion so for example maybe you could imagine a tool where you record some output of this system, and then as an animator, you make some tweaks to it to uh, say how you'd prefer it to look. And then maybe we'd like a tool which propagates these edits to the rest of the big, large motion capture database which you've recorded. Um, and then you can retrain the neural network or these sorts of things. So there's still so much tooling that needs to be done. And it's also worth noting that Machine learning is really a kind of different style of programming to even what most programmers are used to. It's really a completely different beast. And right now, most of the people who are doing it have PhDs or they've been teaching themselves for a long time. So it's also not the thing you can just easily recruit for and say, OK, let's just get this guy and then he'll just do this. Or let's get our existing guy to go and start working on it. So I think like there's, there's still a, a lot of things which are going to have to happen before this is common. So our jobs are safe. We're good for now. For now. At least me, I'm old, so I, maybe I won't have to worry about this. All the young people, <laughs> y'all are screwed, but I'm fine. So that's all I'm uh, No, I was going to say, so machine learning is awesome. It just to the, the two things I know is like it requires a lot of data, which means we need a lot of animations, which basically is a problem and four hours and all that. Second is iteration time because it's a long time to train. So in all of that, I think, like Daniel, as Daniel said, I think it's going to come to some way of tools to um, like to the form of uh, people to use it. And that that can be something more like I want like sold animation or something and then you can some there's just some place like make some or some animation company train all the data and you can just say a word and then it just brings out animation data or something. So way to incorporate it's gonna take some time. Uh, but it like I think with the other part is a kind of one time issue where like uh, um like uh, we have a game where like 100 players has to run so fast, and those things it's hard to use machine learning for it because we like we don't have enough uh, like for mobile having 100 people we cannot even thread anything, <laughs> so it's gonna be very hard. So those things like uh, are very tight, and we just want to do very minimal. So it's a matter of like how much you get out, get out of the system and how much you need to this uh, depending on your game. I think you can totally do it. Some of the game, maybe it's better to just have a certain simpler system, but in a way, if um, this system can come to some way of a tool for user to get the asset data, I think it's going to be awesome. Some. Great. I think a, a big thing is 
if you want your team to be right at the cutting edge of this kind of technology, uh, you need to dedicate people who you are willing to let fail. Um, the, a lot of like... Uh, I want it now, Dan. <laughs> but I mean, a lot, a lot of the research stuff is very like risky and it's kind of like this thing might not work out. It might not be a thing that we can actually put in a game and ship. And so I know that Ubisoft has a team, uh, LaForge, which I think is the team that you work on, and uh, you know EA has a team called Seed, which does similar things, uh, where they're not necessarily, it's people who are not necessarily working on anything that is going to go into a game. It's just, we want to try some things that are high risk and maybe they'll pay off and that'll give us a real, that'll make us be at the cutting edge. Uh, but at, at the same time, you have to be able to kind of like say, well, this is not necessarily going to be pumped into our immediate title. and. Maybe it's only going to be big publishers that are able to afford to, to do that. I don't know. Um, it could be that if you don't have the budget to spend on some expensive research programmers uh, that aren't contributing to your current project, then, uh, then you might be more watching to see what happens with the rest of uh, the industry first and working off that. That seems to be the way most new technology goes. So Sure. Yeah, yeah I think so. All right. Well, um, we've kind of hit the point where we've talked about kind of the stuff that's like, you know, known and, and sort of in the future, like close-ish. Um, do we have any uh, questions from the chat yet that we can start? Have you gotten better at throwing those or am I going to, can, oh. Here we go. <laughs> and there's Mike. That's, and they're all written down here. So I'm going to start reading some questions from the chat. Um, here we go. Axel 99. Hi, Jesse. Uh, what would it take to put acting into motion matching? Does anybody know? So uh, I think r right now people have been using motion matching mainly for locomotion. But the idea of being able to have a high-level goal of what you want and then f to pick from the database uh, something that matches actually fits pretty well with acting. So for example, the motion matching in For Honor it works with attacks too. So you say, I want an, a, this type of attack in this amount of seconds, and I'm currently in this pose, and I need to be like facing this direction. And what it will do is it will search through the database of animation and find the best matching attack. So you can potentially do the same for any kind of tags or any markup you want. So if you want to say, oh, I want the character to be walking in a sad way with this particular nuance to the animation and you have it all tagged up in your database, in theory the same technique should work and should be able to pick these clips from the database. The kind of big question is what happens when it doesn't pick exactly what you want or what happens when you ask for something which isn't in the database how should it fall back? So should it, what is the kind of order of priority? And all these sorts of questions, you need to actually answer them before you can get this sort of system working well in these more general cases. I mean, my question really is, will Andy Serkis take credit for it? So, <laughs> I mean, I just, <laughs> he's not watching. He doesn't know who I am. Uh, <laughs> Dan, did you have a follow-up to that, or would you like, I'm going to go on. All right, next question. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Chopsoki asks, what needs to happen to make style transfer a reality? Actually, that's a good thing for Daniel to... Uh, Is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so th there's a bunch of different research on style transfer for a long, long time now, and one question is about the data you feed it with. So in theory, if you have a lot of data for a lot of different styles and you basically tell it exactly what you want, uh, you can get pretty good results. But let's say you want to transfer the style from uh, a walk to a run or something like this. And there's some sort of nuance to how this style changes when you're running, which you can't really easily say. It's kind of like a, it's a very difficult problem to get it to work exactly how you want in all different cases. It's almost like you can't really expect it to work uh, perfectly in all different cases. It's like too much to ask. Yeah. Really? All right. Did, did you have a follow-up to that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say, because he was talking about the acting and this, and I feel like now motion can make a movie. <laughs> 
they can write a script automatically and they can just create the older acting, <laughs> it's going to come some point. It's really going to piss Andy Serkis off. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. In the same way motion matching works for small sets of keyframe content, uh, have you ever tried a neural network with a similar set? So I guess a small set of keyframe content. Yeah, so the, the thing is, it's sort of the same issue as with the style transfer, which is that when you ask it to extrapolate beyond the training data you've given it, you really don't have very many guarantees about what it's going to do. So that's the reason why people who work with neural networks prefer these really huge sets of training data, because essentially what they want to do is tell it exactly what to do in exactly every case it's going to encounter. So yeah, you can use them with small sets of keyframed animation, uh, but it's much harder to control the sort of results you're getting. And sometimes what you really want to do is like, try and specify more directly how you want it to act. And when you do that, you might end up with something which looks more like a state machine anyway. So I think in the kind of aim of controlling what it does, you probably end up going back to state machines and blend trees and these sorts of more controllable techniques. Right. It seems like a kind of big push on the neural network side, just not just for animation, but across, uh, across the board, is to try and uh, train things faster and with less data. Um, so I don't know exactly how the people go about doing that, but it's like it's a, that it, things will get better over time, I would assume. Yeah. To the point, sorry, go on. Definitely one of the good things about neural networks is that we can borrow lots of research which other people have been doing. So uh, research about how to make neural networks faster, how to make them use less memory, how to make them train faster, how to make them learn from less data. It's kind of, that's one of the nice things about framing your problem as the same as someone else's problem, so that you can borrow all these advancements which come along. So that's one great hope that we'll get lots of these things in the future without having to explicitly focus on them ourselves. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that's all, that's what we had. There was another one that was already answered. Um, so uh, now, Dan, I know that you, yes. you like to f freak out everyone you know with future, future, future stuff. Do you want to, okay. do you want to like we, talk about some of the this? stuff? We're going to go into this one right here and, um. <laughs> and we're so, going to talk about that. So I think kind of where, if we're really looking really far out now, like, you know, five, ten years from now or, or further, um, I think neural networks in general are going to change everything. Like, not, not just um, animation stuff, not just game development, like, everything uh, to do with your life is going to be affected by this. Um, and it's... We, we talk about kind of like generating uh, these systems and stuff, but a, a big thing about that is like, like we've talked about is feeding it with the right kind of like data. And so I think a big kind of push that, uh, that we might also see is a lot of extra work on like how we can improve capture quality. Um, and so neural networks happen to be very good at kind of like dealing with that. And I think one of the holy grail kind of things is uh, being able to get motion capture data from a single source, a uh, single video source. Because if you think about television for the entire of history or like movies or when you're watching sports games or your own cam like phone camera stuff like if every single one of those is a source of mocap it's uh, it, it's going to create like this vast quantity of data which is going to me then mean much better neural network uh, stuff and I think you then start to be able to get into things like uh, taking CCTV footage or something like that of a city and uh, having one neural network that is able to generate motion capture data from that image, and another neural network that's able to uh, label that data to say, uh, okay, I'm going to guess that this person is male. I'm going to guess that this person is six feet tall, that they're this heavy, that they have a limp on their foot because they were injured, or uh, you know, maybe even things like this is who they're going to vote for, or something like that. Um, I don't want to know that. <laughs> and, when you can label that motion capture data with all of that semantic information, you could then get an animation director who says, okay, I need a character who is, uh, you know, 50% of, you know, injured or like uh, this amount tired, this amount tall, this amount heavy. Um, create that character for me. And, uh, or you could feed demographics. You could say, you know, it's this person is really rich or this person is a businessman or this person is whatever else it is. Um, 
and it will just generate a character. And this is not just um, animation stuff. It's, it's also, you know, the same type of neural network development that's happening in terms of generating kind of like costumes and, and um, meshes and all of this kind of like stuff. Um, potentially the next stage then after that is to say, what if we're watching about how these people are moving around a city? And, you know, this person goes into this type of coffee shop and this person gives money to the poor, this person uh, acts this kind of light way, uh, this person drives, this person takes a bike, and so on. And whether or not you can then just say, okay, the next stage after being able to create one person is to be able to say, let's just create a city. Let's, I want a city that is like London in 1986. And say, so, okay, well, we've got all of this information from television shows, we've got all this information from cameras, all of this kind of stuff. I know enough about demographics to say which neighborhoods are going to have which type of people, where they're going to go, how they get to work, all of this kind of like stuff. Um, and to just keep expanding from there, where eventually, maybe it's not even game directors saying this, maybe it's just the user talks to their console and says, I feel like playing a game today that's like, I want to play like a Harry Potter game, and I want it to be a brand new story, and I want it to be in that style, and it's just, okay, well, what do we, what do we know about that? Let's, uh, let's generate this entire game around this, or whatever. I want to play a new Star Wars game. So we're all out of jobs. <laughs> well, Really, Dan? Maybe. This is, this is, a, con this is a, a stream conference to teach everybody about how to be better at their jobs, and you're saying, fair. don't worry about it. You're not going to be relevant. Like to be fair, this is fairly long-term stuff. All of the, I think the individual pieces for this are being worked on to some degree right now, but I mean, as you can sort of see from this video, it's really, really impressive what it's doing, but it's not the same as going to a Vicon stage and capturing like super high quality motion capture. So they're gonna have to work through those problems. Um, but, you know, the motion capture generation is working. There are different papers for uh, semantic labeling where there's stuff to say, I think we've got another uh, uh, image there. Uh, it's this last one here. Uh, so this was a, a paper that was released where um, they could s run s these images through a neural network and it would describe what is in the image. Uh, but it even describes things like relationships between people. So a man is standing next to a clock on a wall. It's not just identifying the clock, it's not just identifying this. And it can do some really in-depth descriptions of what is in these images. Um, and so it's, I mean, this is, like I say, this is where you are able to take this information, tag that to the actual content that's being generated, and then, and then start to associate that with, the, with um, being able to you know, generate whole cities and stuff based on demographics and things like that. Um, this stuff is scary and terrifying, and, uh, but is advancing at a crazy rate. Like, so when are we going to get that in, un <laughs> when are we, when are we gonna get that in Unreal? Oh. <laughs> I don't know in 10 years based on what Dan's <laughs> prediction. <laughs> uh, but for me, um, the animation, I love animated movies. And for me, animation is a creative process. And it's about expression. And as Daniel said, there's many advantages of this uh, machine learning, motion matching system. The problem is that you still lack um, artistic control on the content, what you're seeing. And I think that's just important. So. Um, for me, like, because it's hard to um, picture like machine learning, awesome, beautiful animated movie. <laughs> Watching that seems really far out because you still need this uh, um, expression to be delivered very clearly. Or maybe you can train that. <laughs> but like, I still think it, the artistic control comes from human, and it's the same thing with painting. Like now, there's Photoshop or this picture and beautiful things, but people still want to paint, and they just still, people want to express their expression. So it's, there will be a way to express all that creativity in some level. It may not be exactly what you do now, but it's going to be, there will be something still there. Yeah, I also think it's like, a, again, a question of scale. So for example, uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, the map was roughly like four square kilometers, whereas Origins, it was roughly 100 square kilometers, right? So each year, players are expecting bigger and bigger worlds. So like I said, there was about 15,000 animations in Origins. Are they going to expect 100,000 or a million animations in, in following games by Ubisoft? Like, it's just growing and growing. And we need ways to control and handle that scaling and the expectations. But you can keep the artistic control in the areas that matter, like the story and the key parts of the world where the players interact and these sorts of things. It's more just about how can you realistically grow 
these systems, you can't do everything by hand realistically in a world which is that big with that many animations. Uh, so you have to do some things automatically, I think. Yeah, I think, I think even the creative aspects of it will eventually be solved. It might take a really long time, but it's like stories are still based on rules and animation is based on rules. And uh, we know what, if we have the 12 principles of animation, then we know what looks good and what is appealing. Some of us don't know them. When we're sitting here <laughs> animating, we can't figure out what they are, Yeah, David. I think the really terrifying thing about neural networks is that they, they deal with problems the same way that your brain deals with problems. Um, even though it's one thing to say that, it's like that we're nowhere near creating a general intelligence or anything like that for, a, for AI, but it's, it's still able to... When I don't know how much I want to get. This. <laughs> I'm going to terrify people. We've got a few. We've got a few, like like five minutes left. So if you want to, do you I mean, want to? What you want to go? <laughs> you want to go off the off the reservation? You can five <laughs> minutes. Um, I mean, it's. I know, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> all right. Do we? All right. So uh, do we have any more questions from the chat? Because we're going to have some final thoughts here in a moment. Because we are. Uh, about near the end of our time. Hello, Mike. Thank you. We have one last question, and then we'll go to some final thoughts. This is from JPEG 2.0, who's sitting, you weren't in the chat. Is there any consideration being given to how this neural network data gathering can be abused outside the industry? What is our responsibility to this tech in the near to mid future, if any? <laughs> so I, I think uh, this person is asking about the more like the kind of surveillance style uh, motion capture stuff. So uh, yeah, I think that's like a really good question. And lots and lots of people who work in machine learning and AI are really actually on the ball with these things and looking into how we can do all sorts of uh, you know legal things to make sure that we all agree like what is important and how we can make sure things are always you know the benefit for everyone mm -hmm. yeah i know that ea right now is currently like going through a process of evaluating the ethical standards basically for developing these kinds of things and to try and avoid uh, misusing it. it it's definitely a te like any technology it can be misused and uh, it's just a case of making sure that we don't do that why are you looking at me like I'm going to do it? I don't know how to do any of this. All right, I think, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Or All right, I think we're, we're good for uh, last thoughts on this. Um, so, I, I mean, thank you all for, for talking um, and, you know, kind of going over what the current and the, the near and the far future stuff is. Um, if there's anything uh, you wanted uh, the viewers to take away from this, what would that be today? Uh, I think that animators should not necessarily be scared of this. Um, I think there are, at least not for another 30 years or something, like, um, because it may be that certain tasks are taken over, but there are some really, really hard things to solve with neural networks, like trying to get a human performance relies on a lot of knowledge about the human experience that is hard to codify. And so there is always going to be things like that that need to be uh, done by animators. Maybe they won't be building the locomotion system anymore, but um, there will definitely be like, it, that just means that we can make our games much better in other places. I look forward to no more turn left 45, turn right 45, turn right 90, <laughs> turn right 92, the second one, B, O2. Yeah, so let's get on that. Um, so, um, the, like, for me, the, so all this locomotion, the machine learning, those black box can provide some tedious work, save some tedious work from animators, maybe, because you might you don't have to do the same thing, but I still think there's artistic control that has to go in. Um, also, it's going to be like uh, um, many things in games, especially are um, like lacks tools. Like there's many things that lacks tools because um, people don't, like think they can just go Maya and do stuff and input the bag and that's gonna all fix it. But I feel like there's many places we can actually um, 
provide a better way of expressing it. I'm all about animating easy because I tried it and I was just so bad at it. So for me, there will be many ways to, um, like I almost want to make like 10 years old can animate. Like I want to make a tool that's that easy so they can express what they want to say. So for me, that's really still cool. So yeah, machine learning will be used in some tools like right now they're like facial has a very active way of uh, training system and they, they will be used just to I don't know about taking over the world yet but you know we we'll see <laughs> it'll be okay Dan it'll be okay yeah so I think uh, lots of the machine learning stuff is still quite early research so there's definitely no need to be scared or feel that all of this is everything suddenly going to change uh, so it's good to keep an eye out for the tools. So maybe some tools are going to start appearing which use these sorts of techniques. And it's good to be aware that people are working on these things where there's a lot of data and trying to make things really data-driven. But uh, there's, there's always going to be so many things to do and so many ways to improve the, the quality and the content and the animation. Awesome. All right. Well, that's our time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the uh, Future of Games Animation panel. Uh, Dan, Lena, and Dan, thank you again for all of your insights. And uh, up next, uh, Mike Youngbluth is going to be interviewing Melissa Shim. Thank you.